Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today. As you may know, this is our second annual Medicaid Managed Care Plan billing panel. So we're very excited to be joining you today with our esteemed panelists. Before we get started, I'm going to run through just a few quick logistics. So this panel will be recorded, and the recording and the slides will be posted to our website. So you will be able to access them at ctechny.org if you want to look at any of the links, et cetera, that are shared via the presentation today. So you will have access to that. Also, we will have a ample amount of time for Q&A. So please do submit your questions. You can submit them in throughout. You do not have to wait until we begin the Q&A portion. And with that, we are going to begin. So I'm Caitlin from MCTAC. And again, I want to welcome you all to today's Medicaid Managed Care Plan billing panel. All right, so a quick overview of what we're doing today. I'm going to do a brief review of some of the tools that are available to you around billing, around working with Medicaid Managed Care Plans. Then we will turn it over to our plan panel. Each of the panelists are going to begin by giving a short presentation with general billing information, um, links, helpful resources, et cetera. And then we will spend the whole second half of our time together today on Q&A. And we'll start with the questions that people submitted via the pre-event survey. Thank you to all of those who were able to submit questions then. And then we'll also take questions submitted in the chat. So again, if you're just joining us, please feel free to chat in your questions to the host and panelists throughout, and we will have ample time for Q&A. All right, so just to start us off, I'm just going to walk us through a few of the tools that are available on the MCTAC website for you to use as resources. So we are going to start by looking at the matrix. So if you're not familiar with the matrix, you can find it by going to matrix.ctacny.org. You can also find it via the tools section of our website. So a number of different ways to find it. And this is a great resource because it has contact information for all of the plans that are serving um, New York State for Medicaid Managed Care. So you can search it a number of ways by region, by county, by the plan itself, if you're looking for one specific plan that you're contracted with, et cetera. So you have a number of different options. And if you click through, you'll see contact information in a variety of areas. So there's general children's, there's billing section for each plan, there's also a UM section. You can find a lot of useful contact information if you're not sure who to touch base with from the plans you're contracting with when you have a question. We also have on here several UM guides that you can access, including a grid for CFTSS. So that tells you the authorization requirements for each of the plans for the various CFTSS services which are the Children and Family Treatment Services and Supports. We've also got it for the Children's HCBS, so Home and Community-Based Services has a grid. And again, it's got all of the different plans on it if you scroll down and their requirements. And we also have one for other limited health-related services as part of Article 29i Health Facilities. So you've got those resources that are also linked within the matrix as well as independently on our website as resources for you. We also have our billing tool, which again, you can find under tools, or you can go straight to billing.ctechny.org. And so if you're looking on there, you'll find an interactive claims form. So we've got all of the different fields listed. And then if you click on a certain field, you'll see the different requirements, the nuances, if there's some plans that are an exception to the general rule, et cetera and you can use that as a resource. So this is the general billing tool that is applicable across behavioral health, outpatient services, billing, Medicaid, managed care. We also have a 29i specific billing tool, which you can see here. This is the 29i health facility billing tool for core and other lim limited health related services. So both of those are available to you depending on what type of programs, what type of services you provide, you can those out. All right. So those are some of our tools. We also have a few other tools, including the top denials tool, which just goes through some of the common or more common reasons for denial. So you can look at how to um, address them or how to avoid them occurring in the first place. 
Well, as you can see here, one of them is about timely filing, which I'm sure we'll discuss in more detail today. We've also got revenue cycle management best practices, things like having a centralized scheduling system, things like uh, making sure you inform the plans if there's a change, you offer a new program, you have a new address, et cetera. You wanna make sure you let the plans know. So there's those best practices listed here. And you've also got the best billing and RCM practices, the number one of which is of course to communicate and stay in contact about billing, stay in contact with your plans about if you're seeing a reason for a denial you don't understand, if you're seeing an issue or if you're seeing something that might come up, always reach out, be proactive and stay in communication. All right, so with that, we are gonna turn it over to our plan panel. And we are going in alphabetical order today. So we are gonna start with Excellus and Sarah. So Sarah, take it away. Awesome, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm gonna walk you through the Excellus portion of this presentation. So on the next slide, we're gonna go over our behavioral health provider relations team. Um, so many of you have probably worked with us in the past, and if you have not, feel free to reach out. We have Jennifer DeMars, she is our manager of behavioral health provider relations and her contact information is identified on the slide here. And then we have Michelle Scott. Michelle works um, primarily with solo and group providers. She also works with OMH and Oasis licensed facilities um, in the Rochester region. So her county area is identified um, on the slide. And then we have Brian Federley with his specialties that he works with, with behavioral health providers, and then his area of coverage and contact information. Um, and then my name, Sarah Newsom, um, my information is identified on the slide, as well as the areas um, that I cover as well, um, and all of the specialties. So if you ever need to reach out um, and connect with us, always feel free um, to do so. We're now gonna go through a health plan overview. With the provider portal, um, you can register. And if you have not yet registered for the provider portal, all of that information is identified in this picture here. We also have tip sheets. Um, if you need assistance with registering for the portal, please feel free to reach out because we can provide you a tip sheet. The provider portal really allows you to check membership and eligibility. If maybe you want to do a status on claims, um, if you have a claim adjustment, um, maybe you need to look up uh, authorizations or even submit a prior authorization for services. That can all be done through the provider portal. If you have questions on navigating, because there's just there's so much that is on the provider portal, always feel free to reach out. We would be happy to do a navigating of the portal to kind of walk through all of the nuances as well as the ins and outs of the portal. If you ever have questions regarding um, claim submissions, you can always reach out. If you're having trended type issues, um, you can feel free to reach out to your provider relations rep. We do accept both electronic and paper claim submissions. And then we also wanna highlight provider training. Um, so our behavioral health provider relations reps, we offer a variety of different training topics. Um, we have new ones that are on our website, so you can go right to the Excellus Provider Portal and look at all of our exciting and new training topics that we offer to our network. We're gonna review communicating with Excellus and kind of who those key contacts are. Um, so if you are doing any updates and or changes to your contract, uh, maybe you're designated for new services, you're adding specific locations, you can always reach out to Don Hassett. Don Hassett is our manager of behavioral health network development and his contact information is identified on the slide. If you're having difficulty ever outreaching to someone, you can always include your uh, provider relations representative. That way we can help assist you as well. Um, as I mentioned before, if you have like trended claims issues or concerns, always feel free to reach out and provide claim examples. That way we can do a little bit of digging and some research and find out what's going on. 
Um, if there is anything that you have questions on regarding like case management or critical incident reporting, all of that contact information um, is populated on the slide as well. Or even if you have questions regarding like eligibility for a member, you can contact customer care. So we tried to give you all of the contact information. Now we're gonna go into kind of the meat of the presentation. So the billing and coding portion. So when we talk about billing, um, one of the things that we do want to highlight, and I did state this before, we do accept both paper claims or electronic claim submissions. So maybe you are a provider that has been submitting on paper claims and now it, you're transitioning over to electronic claims. Always feel free to reach out. We would be happy to do claims testing, make sure everything is running smoothly through the system. We can connect you with our EDI team, um, but just note that we accept both. Um, if you are submitting, maybe you have an individual who has um, a nationwide Blue Cross Blue Shield policy, maybe they have um, a primary and secondary policy, you can submit those claims through the health plan. We can walk you through that process as well. For timely filing, our timely filing limits is 90 days with an additional 30 days. So if you're outside of those timely filing limits and you do have questions regarding submitting claims, we urge you to outreach to your provider relations representative. That way we can figure out what's going on and assist with that. Um, for making sure that when you're submitting claims, um, as Caitlin mentioned, there's the MCTAC billing tool, and it's a fantastic resource. We do want to highlight that our, there are specific um, fields that need to be required um, when you are submitting a claim. Um, and so we're going to walk through a little bit about um, with Excellus what information is required. Um, so if you ever need to contact our EDI team, their email address is populated on um, the last line here. Now we're gonna walk into more billing and coding. As I mentioned, there is specific information that is required on a claim form when sending. Um, so all of these fields are needed when submitting a clean claim. Um, and this information is also populated on the MCTAC billing tool as well. So if you ever need to reference it, um, it is there. Um, as well. And if you have questions around any of these fields, always feel free to reach out that we, we can walk through it with you. Now we're going to talk about paper claim submission. When submitting a paper claim, um, please make sure that it is as clear as possible. What happens is you mail that in or you can upload that to our Smart Data Solutions portal. Um, once it's within either the portal or we receive it via mail mail um, at the ad address identified at the bottom, um, it is scanned in um, and there is like a human that is scanning in this information. So we wanna make sure that it is as clear as possible. Um, if there is something that is not clear, so maybe you have um, a digit like 038, we'll say, and the three is really close to the zero and it looks like an eight, um, it might enter in the system as an eight. Um, so just making sure that when you are populating it, make sure it's typed, um, you can use fillable PDFs, um, so we can walk through that process with you. Um, and if you are new to the Smart Data Solutions portal, we would be happy to do a walkthrough. It's pretty easy to just upload um, paper claims to that portal as well. Our next uh, topic that we're going to talk about is electronic claims. Um, electronic claims are really the most efficient way um, to submit claims. They have a really quick turnaround in our system. Um, so I've worked with a lot of providers um, with new services. So we'll just use like um, the adult core services, for example. Um, so if you are new to submitting claims or you are submitting claims for the core service and you just want to make sure are they entering the system okay? Um, is it hitting any like snags on either the provider or the plan end? Um, having that electronic claim submission can let us go in and look at the claim and see 
Is it processing appropriately? Are there any errors? It enters our system um, typically within 48 hours, and then we're able to respond back to you pretty quickly. So if you reach out and you say, hey, Sarah, I submitted claims. I have a question. I just want to make sure um, that they're processing appropriately. I can go in and check for you. Um, and if we see that it's going to hit any um, denials, then we can work through that pretty quickly. Um, if you are new to electronic um, submissions, we always urge um, to reach out with, to our EDI team as well, and their information is populated on the, on the bottom of the slide. Um, they're really fantastic. They get back to you pretty quickly, um, and we're able to kind of flush through any issues that you're having. Um, so always, like I said, it's going to be very repetitive, but feel free to reach out if you do have questions. We really want to make sure that um, things are running really smoothly. Moving more into billing, um, we're going to talk about um, just when submitting a claim. And I know that there has been a lot of questions regarding this. Um, I know when I talk to 29i providers, this is something that is brought up a lot is just around if an individual has a primary and a secondary policy um, and when to submit those claims, how to submit those claims. Um, so just noting that um, if, they're, if you have a member who has coordination of benefits, so they have a primary and secondary policy, um, once you submit that information, the date on that, so when you're submitting for coordination of benefits, the claim begins on the date the payment re was received for the primary payer. So for example, if you submitted that and you received um, a date of, um, we'll say 4-1, then that date for the primary payer would be 4-1. So you might have like 90 days from that date to submit to the secondary payer. Um, so just making sure that you're um, reviewing that information. Um, if you do have claims that are submitted outside of the timely filing limits, again, feel free to reach out and we can work um, to understand why they were submitted um, outside of the timely filing limits um, and if we can help assist. So if you do have specific claims questions, claims denials, we really urge you to reach out. That way we can walk through all of them. We're gonna go into reminders. Um, I know that we've had a lot of questions regarding our common denial reasons. Um, and so the ones that we see very frequently are the duplicate claim denial, primary carrier, subscriber termination, and then no authorization on file. Um, so just making sure that you're checking membership and eligibility, you'll see that a person's subscriber ID may change. Um, based on when they recertify, how they recertify. Um, so just making sure that you're checking that information. And then if there's not an auth on file, um, you can work back with our clinical team to receive an auth for services. And then lastly, we're gonna talk about interpretation services. Um, so if you are billing for interpretation services, we do have tip sheets um, that can assist with billing, but wanted to provide um, this information around when billing for services, um, what that looks like. So if you do have specific questions regarding um, billing for interpretation services, please feel free to reach out and we can provide you additional resources. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it back over to Caitlin. Thank you so much, Sarah. And now I will turn it over to Fidelis and Casey. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Casey Rudy. I'm a behavioral health specialist with Fidelis Care. Thank you for inviting Fidelis this afternoon to the panel. Um, just to go over a couple of helpful resources that Fidelis is able to offer our providers. We have our provider manual, which is found on our FidelisCare.org website. The link is there provided. We wanted to call out some of the important sections um, to help you along with your day-to-day -day, um, items. So part um, section 12, there's two parts, one and two. There's the claim submission and billing guidelines. This is where you will find things such as our electronic billing payer identification codes, as well as our paper mailing address for those paper claims that you may need to submit. And any billing guidelines that are needed as far as uh, claim requirements, necessary fields. 
Section 21 is dedicated to our behavioral health section. Section 24 is our HARP. Section 25 is related to those children expanded benefits, such as the 29I, which recently was updated last year. And then section 26 for our telehealth and telemedicine. We should all be familiar with that over the past two years. So please refer to those sections if you have any questions or concerns. You also have your provider relations rep that is assigned to your area, along with your BH provider specialist for that area. There are four BH provider specialists total throughout the state to assist you. We also have our authorization requirements. Each month, if there's updates to our authorization grids, you will find that under the year and then the month with any updates necessary. The link there is provided for those grids. We also have a section for our provider tip sheets. This is a great link. Um, a number of tip sheets are out there for various things. We have our children's HCBS, CFTSS, coding billing tip sheets, our 29I, and then our adult HCBS, HARP, and core transition um, tip sheets are out there for your reference. Next. In addition, on the provider um, access online, we have capabilities to assist you with checking your eligibility online. It makes it for a fast, easy turnaround for your front end staff and checking eligibility upon the patient's arrival for their service. You may also explain status and history, obtain your remittance advice, and other important announcements. Um, notifications to our entire provider network will be posted out there, uh, updating your uh, model of care agreements each year is found out there as well on the secure provider access. You can access this request um, by contacting our call center with provider services, or you can speak with your provider relations representative and they can assist you in setting that up. You may also request uh, authorizations online and checking that status as well. Next. We're going to get into talking about claims. Uh, we do accept electronic submissions of claims, and this is our preferred method. It allows for faster reimbursement and cleaner processing of the claims. A reduction in elimination of denials or claims not being received through snail mail, which we have seen in the past. And then, of course, that proof of timely submission through electronic uh, via your acceptance and rejection report. We do want to make note that keeping track of those acceptance and rejection reports is crucial. Um, if the claims do reject, we want to make sure that we identify that immediately and correct any issues to avoid any timely filing. We do allow uh, the preferred clearinghouse. We use Ability, and that contact information is there on the screen. And we also use Ability. That is a free care online claim submission through Ability. And if you wish to learn more, you can contact them via the phone number listed or their website. You also have the option to initiate through your own clearinghouse the 837 transmission to Fidel's Care. The clearinghouse will need to confirm with our EDI that they are able to bill um, through the Fidel's Care directly. And as of 1 1 of 22, we started to allow our secondary claims to bill electronically. Um, this was something that we've been um, working on, and we did kick that off the beginning of this year. So if you have not yet tried to do a secondary claim, please contact your provider relations rep or your provider behavior specialist, and we will assist you in getting that uh, on this way. Next. Okay, so some updates for 2022. For our PROS providers, as of February 1st, we no longer require prior authorization for PRO services. So this will now be included in our outlier management program. What that means is that a Fidel's Care clinical staff member will conduct a phone outreach and they'll just discuss basic clinical needs. The phone call will take about 15 minutes per case and it varies um, depending on the necessity of that patient's needs uh, and the risk being needed. It could be monthly to semi-annually, but that is what we're moving towards um, as of 2020, I'm sorry, February 1st of 2022. Next. We have another service, uh, our care management services are great and they will assist you with various things for your clients. Care coordination, um, making sure that the member is receiving all the services possible and getting the care that they need. 
how can we provide education on their health condition and work as a team between your office, our care manager, and the patient. And then we can also help link them with any community resources that are available in their area for their needs. How do you know if your patient is enrolled? The heart members are enrolled and they will have that age code on their eligibility. And then our children's HCBS will have that K code to identify that they are under care management. Those two individuals will be able to have a care manager assigned and we can work with you if needed. Next. We put up here just our contact information, how you'll be able to contact a care manager, um, the phone line and then the various extensions depending on the product that the member is enrolled under. We also have a care management tip sheet which that's okay, Kaylin. Um, the link is there and that's also found out on our fideliscare.org portal. That is the non-secure portal. So anybody can access that at any time. And that is a great tip, tip sheet as well to view. Next. And for our BH contact information, we have several different departments. Um, as we work together as a team, we have our BHQ. We provided their phone number, their fax number, and then their email, should you wish to email them. We have a designated harp queue, our children's Medicaid, Article 29. We currently have an, a general email box um, that is uh, reviewed by a couple individuals, and then they farm it out to anyone in the company that may need to assist in the question, whether it be pharmacy, sales and marketing, provider relations, so on and so forth. And then, of course, our behavioral health phone extensions. Thank you for your time today. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, Casey. And now we will turn it over to Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York and Mary. Good afternoon. My name is Mary Ferber and I'm a network relations consultant manager for Mira Group. And as most of you know, Mira Group um, partners with Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York to administer the uh, Medicaid Managed Care and Child Health Plus programs. Next slide, please. So I thought it would be helpful to start out uh, with an overview, a health plan overview of um, some of the tools that we have available and resources. So one of the first things you should do um, when um, enrolling with the health plan, or if you haven't yet, would be to register with Availity. Availity is our secure portal where there uh, um, are several resources available to you um, to use for billing and for checking member eligibility. So Availity is the website for Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York for Medicaid product. And on that website, you will find our EDI uh, transmission information, um, the billing procedures, claim submission guidance and copies of forms, and then member eligibility inquiries can be done on that site. Um, here is the contact information for Availity, uh, and then also they have um, online support as well. And then there's um, the website listed right there where you can register for the Availity portal. Next. I'd also point out that we have a non-secure portal which can be accessed through um, availability or can be accessed on its own um, called payer spaces and provider self service. So you can navigate to payer spaces and select provider self serve to find the information and we have um, written the information related to the policies and procedures for um, claims and billing um, EDI registration information to enroll in electronic funds transfer we use enroll safe now. Um, so there's information available on that vendor. Um, and then also our provider manual. And I will point you to um, chapter 13 in our provider manual, which has all of our billing policies and procedures. And um, of course you can download it, save it. We um, update our um, manual. Um, so, you know, check often for any kinds of changes. Um, and then to get to the provider self-serve, you'll select the resources tab um, and then the Highmark Blue Cross and Blue Shield, uh, and that will redirect you. 
So just, just kind of a side note, you know, and you saw that another payer actually uses Availity. So there's lots of different plans that you'll see in information available when you when you go to the first landing page on Availity. But um, when you, you select your payer in the upper right hand corner of the Availity landing screen, that will get you to your specific payer. And then once you're in there, then you're gonna be on um, their sort of homepage uh, within Availity and then get your plan specific resources. So um, just thought that that would be helpful to point out. Next slide. So how to submit claims. So we have, um, as other plans do, we accept um, electronic and paper claims. Uh, we also have a tool that's available through the Availity website. Um, you can, there, there are preferred clearinghouse Availity is, so you can do batch claims processing uh, with through them. Um, but then also there's a tool Availity, uh, available on Availity, uh, which will allow you to enter a claim yourself. And uh, that's helpful for folks who would like to do electronic billing, but um, maybe don't have significant volume. Um, we know that we've had um, a couple of our 29 eyes uh, use this tool. They love it because once the information is entered, it's viewed as an electronic claim and the electronic claims are um, great. They're processed more quickly, more efficiently. Um, and so we encourage electronic billing. Uh, there's the um, address if you are still billing on paper or need to bill on paper. Um, and so as one of the other plans pointed out, it's really important that your claim form, if you are billing on paper, is very clear. And so one of the, um, I don't know if folks really kind of understand that once the claim is accepted by the plan, then these claims get imaged in. Um, and then from the imaging, they get indexed. And that's a step where um, an, a claim might pause for an individual to actually review that claim form to clarify any kind of issue with the scanning. So it's really important for the claims to be as clear as possible, not handwritten, but typed. Um, and um, but if you are having issues uh, with your claims and paper billing, you can certainly reach out um, well, to our service area or to myself for any questions. Um, and then also uh, it was highlighted at the beginning of the presentation, but the McTac website has just a wonderful, wonderful, uh, is wonderful resource for all kinds of tools. And so, um, you know, um, use that website to uh, find um, the images for the UB04s. Um, they're great. You can click on the different fields. You can get the definitions, what rules apply to which plans. Really super helpful um, if you are just moving into, um, you know, billing on UB04s. Just a great, just a great resource. So um, next slide, please. So claim definitions. We'll talk a little bit about a clean claim. Uh, from our perspective, uh, is a request for payment for service uh, when rendered by a provider, it must be submitted timely. Um, for our plan, it's 120 days, a little bit longer than um, some other plans, but um, you know, it must be submitted within uh, the timely filing um, um, time period. Uh, it is accurately completed uh, with all required fields filled in per the billing guidelines. Um, it's submitted in a HIPAA compliant um, a format, uh, which includes paper and electronic, uh, and it requires no further information. And um, so, you know, we look for um, to process clean claims. We can process them as quickly as possible. Um, and so, you know, we, we really encourage you to ensure that your claims are clean prior to submission. Um, next, we have rejected and denied claims. There's two types of notices. Um, the rejected claim is a claim that doesn't make it into our adjudication system. So it's not making it through those um, HIPAA compliant edits up front. And so you'll receive a rejection notice. If you're electronic billing, you should be looking for that file uh, for your rejections. Um, if you're billing on paper, you will get paper notification of rejection. And then there's denied claims. Those are claims that go through the adjudication process, but there's a reason for um, the claim 
for it to be denied. And that reason uh, will be found on your EOP. So um, find claim status information at availability.com. That's another um, tool that's helpful for electronic billing to see, check on the status of your claims and also to file appeals for the claims. Next. Claim timeliness and disputes. So as I mentioned, um, our timely filing, uh, you need to submit claims within 120 days from the date of service, submit the claim within 120 days of receiving a response from the third party payer in the case of other insurance. Uh, claims for members who have eligibility uh, has not been added to the state's eligibility system uh, must be received within 120 days from the date that the eligibility is known. Um, any claim not submitted within 120 days will be denied for timely filing. Um, and then corrected claims within uh, 90 days of filing uh, the resubmission period. Uh, claim payment disputes must be filed within 45 days of the adjudicated date of the uh, EOP. You can file um, an appeal, the address is listed there, or you can file it um, electronically through Availity. When you um, submit it electronically through Availity, it's super easy. You just bring up uh, the claim. You're looking for a status on that claim. And then in the lower right-hand corner, if you feel like appealing it, you just click on the appeal button and the appeal will be uh, submitted. You can submit additional information on the appeal. So, um, and that again is accessible through Availity. So next, common denial reasons. So um, I broke them up into the children's uh, behavioral health service versus adult behavioral health services. There's just some slight differences. You'll see some common things there. The number one is um, untimely filing uh, for clean or corrected claims. Um, billing errors for the CFTSS or HCBS, I'd say we're seeing a lot less of that now, um, occasionally on the 29i. Um, modifier inappropriate for procedure. So it could be the provider that has the inappropriate modifier. Those who work with us, of course, understand that through um, the um, sort of the rollout of the telehealth, our health plan was having problems with inappropriate modifier. So, um, so anyway, if, if we, we just look for the claim to be coded correctly with the appropriate modifiers in order to have uh, correct payment. Duplicate claims. So I guess this happens um, from um, on the provider side when you are submitting your claims and then you feel you haven't received payment timely, so you're resubmitting the claims. At the same time, a claim is getting adjudicated, you're sending the same claim through. So then you're getting um, um, duplicate denials. Maybe common for you, um, however, um, you know, it, it understanding that um, you know, you are looking for payment timely. And so you're going to go ahead and resubmit claims um, if you haven't received payment. Uh, limits exceeded. Now I'm saying that this um, for CFTSS and uh, claims uh, is a plan issue. So we know that for the CFTSS claims and HCBS, children's HCBS, these are soft limits. And so uh, when a claim comes through, uh, we'll take a look at uh, the claim and evaluate um, if it's denied for, for limits and you feel it's inappropriate, please reach out uh, for a question. Um, and we can certainly help you out. Denied for um, pre-authorization not obtained. This is for children's HCBS services predominantly, um, probably likely just a workflow issue within the provider's um, offices not requesting um, um, authorization. So we're running reports regularly. And so we can see who, which providers are not requesting authorizations and we'll reach out to you and um, we'll talk to you about those specific cases and then very likely ask you to submit uh, for that authorization. Um, if clinically accepted, uh, would approve a retro authorization. For adult behavioral health services, again, untimely filing is number one. Primary carrier info required, not complete or missing is number two. That happens often. Um, member, no active coverage on the coverage date, which really um, sort of goes back to ensuring that you're reviewing member eligibility um, and you know which health plan actually should be billed um, for the service. Um, deny preauthorization not obtained. 
um, and then disallow not under contract. And usually the service, I mean, if you're billing it, us for the service, it's allowed under your contract, but when the claim is not billed correctly, like inappropriate modifiers, it looks, it, you know, the system is wanting to pay that claim, but it's not seeing it as a part of your fee schedule. It's not billed correctly. So it'll come back as to you as a disallow lot, not under contract. So when you do see that, make sure that you're looking to ensure that you're submitting clean claims. If you still feel that there's a problem, please reach out to me and then we can assist with that. Next. Authorization and notification requirements. So we do have a section uh, in the provider manual, uh, chapter six, um, behavioral health services that goes over all of the information related to authorizations. We know that there's a lot of information for the children's um, services and for adult services. So I would really refer uh, you to that specific chapter to review, to uh, determine which services require authorization or notification. Uh, to request an authorization, uh, you can uh, fax in or call our service department. Um, you can also um, um, submit it via a, a request form, um, and the link to that form is listed right there on the slide. And then if you have a grievance or appeal, there is the information there to mail it in or to fax in that appeal. Next. So uh, recently transitioned services. So I'll just mention that uh, we do understand there's some questions related to core. So I just note that Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York is not yet an approved HARP plan, although we are in the application process. That application process has taken a bit longer um, than we had anticipated due to the COVID. Um, and folks had to kind of reallocate resources to different, more important things. Um, so we're unable to accept a request for um, adult HCV as services presently. We'll certainly let you know um, when we're looking to go live, we hope, fingers crossed, that it's the summer, but we're still yet under review by the state. Um, the Children's Behavioral Health Services uh, recently um, uh, transitioned. Some claims are denying for limits. I talked about that earlier. So contact provider relations for this issue. Contact me directly. Um, Article 29I services at the time, actually, that this slide was being developed, the COVID-19 counseling for unvaccinated um, individuals was sort of the new service published out, but that's sort of now water over the bridge. And um, But if you are um, needing to bill that, we can certainly, our, our services are configured to pay for that. Next. So contact information. So here is my contact information. And I'll just mention, I didn't mention it up front. Um, but I am the dedicated um, network representative for all of behavioral health. Um, Amerigroup, Highmark, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, obviously services the Western the eight Western New York counties and contiguous counties to Western New York. So I have the whole territory, um, but you can contact our service area for information. Um, which is really a quick way to get statuses on claims, um, check status on providers, things like that. If you have more complicated issues, um, you're having batches of claims that aren't processing, you are adding a service onto your fee schedule, um, certainly give me a call and um, I can you know, sort of help you through that. Um, I also have Kathy Leonard, who is our foster care liaison and health home uh, manager. Um, if you're a 29i or a health home, you know her and you've worked with her, um, but just, just thought that it would be helpful to have her information. Both of our information too is available on the McTag plan matrix, along with the folks that work in our UM and case management areas. So make sure that you refer to that matrix for additional information. Again, the information is going to be listed separately for a mayor group versus if let's say you want to contact Highmark, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, their contact information is listed up there as well. And I think that's it. So I'll pass it back to Caitlin for United. Thank you, Mary. And now we will turn it over to United Healthcare and Heidi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Heidi Hopkins. I'm from United and I'm the manager of provider relations for behavioral health. So let's jump right into it here, right? We all wanna know how are we gonna get paid? 
So here's how you submit your claims electronically. Our payer ID is 87726. However, if you cannot submit a, an electronic claim, you can submit a paper claim. Um, you just wanna make sure you're using an original UBO4 claim form, no photocopy. You're gonna to wanna to type it to make sure that we can read exactly what's coming in on there and complete all the required fields. Mail your paper claims to Optum Behavioral Health at the address below in Salt Lake City, Utah. Next slide, please. So some claim submission tips, right? Sometimes we submit claims and we see denials. So here's some tips for success, right? Always verify that member eligibility prior to rendering services. Make sure that if the member has some other coverage, the primary EOB is included. Obtain your authorization for services that require it. Make sure you're using the 24 value code and the applicable rate code in the correct field. We know that a lot of the children's services, especially those rate codes um, mixed with the procedure code and modifiers, they can be a little bit tricky. So you wanna make sure you're checking that before you submit your claim. And only one rate code per claim and include the uh, procedure codes, modifiers, and service units as applicable. And when you submit electronically, there cannot be the hyphen in your tax identification number. NPI numbers are required. And make sure, this is the very important one, is make sure you're reviewing those provider remittance advice timely, um, because as you'll see in a couple of slides, we are, you know, there's some, dates with corrected claims being submitted and whatnot and timely filing. Next slide, please. So next we're gonna talk about appeals. What happens when your claim denies, right? So if you need to appeal your claim based on the outcome of the claim, I wanna make sure that you have the information that you need. So the appeal of your claim payment or denial within 60 days, we want that within 60 days of receipt of the provider remittance advice. So again, that's why it's really important to make sure you're reviewing those timely. So below you'll see the address where you would submit your appeals to. There's also a fax number that you could fax in the appeal information as well. Next slide, please. This is our authorization and notification slide. So a lot of our services do require authorization before you can render them, right? So um, we do have a system, we call it PAN. It's the provider prior authorization and notification system. You wanna make sure you have all the supporting documentation that you need in order to submit. And you'll see the link down there, the uhcprovider.com backslash PAN. If you're unable to do it that way, you'll see that you can submit telephonically um, the information that's required is your TIN, um, and then you would select care notifications and prior authorizations. Make sure that you have that UHC member ID and you're entering that along with their date of birth and make sure to select mental health. Next slide, please. So this is a big one. Let's talk about timely filing and the timeliness of corrected claims. We do allow 120 calendar days from the data service for claims to be submitted and to be considered timely. Um, our claims also, we allow 120 days from the initial receipt of the claim for you to submit a corrected claim. When you submit a corrected claim to us, um, if you're submitting it on you know, the paper claim form, make sure that you're updating that frequency code in the third position of box four um, to let us know that it's a corrected claim. Because if we don't know it's a corrected claim, it's probably gonna deny as a duplicate. Um, on the electronic submission, you'll see the loops and segments listed below um, that you're gonna wanna make sure that you update and exactly what needs to go in there in loop 2300. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's where you'll see our online resources. So I know, you know, when we talked about the first slide and um, checking member eligibility, it's very important. So you would go out to uhcprovider.com and you can check that eligibility prior to rendering those services. Um, you can also check claim status and payments um, and there's other tools and resources there as well. Um, UHCCommunityPlan.com really has a lot of um, information in regards to the community plan, not as specific to behavioral health, um, 
which is our providerexpress.com. This is probably a website that you would use most. Um, all of our policies and procedures are listed out there. Our network manual is listed out there. There's a lot of information in the network manual um, that's relevant for you know day-to-day -day claim submissions and maybe some questions that you might have can be found in that network manual. There's also a guide to um, that PAN system that I was talking about in regards to submitting those notifications. You can do demographic updates on Provider Express. Um, there's also a specific page out there um, for New York resources, and it does have our trainings out there um, and things that are just specific to New York um, on Provider Express. Um, there's many, many resources out there on Provider Express. And then Live and Work Well, that's where you can um, search our database for in network providers. Next slide, please. Oh, and that was it. Thank you very much. Um, all of our network provider relations folks are, are listed out on the MCTAC matrix. So you can contact them um, based on your area, or if you're unsure, just use my contact information and I can definitely direct you to the correct place. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. I just want to take a second to thank all of our great panelists before we open it up for Q&A. So thank you all for joining us. And now we're going to turn it over to Q&A, which is going to be moderated by Boris. So please do submit your questions into the chat. Uh, we've got a number of questions in already, and we'll start going through those. If you've joined late, just as a reminder, we have plan representation from Excellus, Fidelis, Highmark Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York and United. So those are our panelists today. Please submit your billing questions. All right, thank you, uh, Caitlin and everybody. And one more reminder, I know there've been a number of questions. We are recording this and both the slides and the recordings will be available uh, on our website. It usually takes us at least a couple of days, but it will be there. And so, uh, as Caitlin mentioned, I'm really enjoying all the questions that have been coming in. And so keep them coming. We'll try to get to as many questions um, as possible. So before we start, one of the things that we get a lot of questions on today is no exception, is about authorizations and notification. And as you saw, every plan touched on it during their presentations because they know, um, you know that we get a lot of those questions. So one of the things I'm just going to mention uh, before we jump in, you know, actually this was, a, uh, I think, a question that came in as well. Even for instances, either because the plan decided or the state uh, kind of stated that there's no authorization required uh, or even official notification, I always tell providers, no matter what, you should always be communicating with the plan. So no matter, at, at a minimum, you should be calling the plan and letting them know that you're gonna be working with this individual. Um, of course, if you need authorization, you should definitely be doing that, or if you need to make an official notification, you should be doing that. But there's many reasons why you would like to have that communication ongoing, because one is you. one of the things you can do is ask lots of questions, like eligibility when you call, you can also verify if the individual is getting services anywhere else, or if there is potentially you're, you're heading into some duplication, you might not be aware that maybe the services they're seeking from you, they're actually also getting somewhere else. So all of that communication is good. And at the same time, it provides the plan with the information that you're gonna be working with this individual. So again, just as an overarching rule, I always tell folks, you know, we'll get into more specifics about authorization, of course, and notifications and so forth. But I always encourage, no matter what, please communicate with your plan. Please let them know that you're working with individuals because um, sometimes you get surprised. Um, and because I've seen too many times where providers say, you know, well, we don't need notification, we don't need authorization, so there's no reason to call the plan. And to some degree, I guess that's true. Um, and then, of course, you run into like, wait a second, but they're also getting services somewhere else and I'm getting denial for duplication or I didn't realize that we're not eligible anymore or uh, any of those issues. So just since I had two seconds, I figure I'll uh, say those couple of things. But let's just get into some of that denial. I think we've got a number of questions around denials. 
especially around, um, and again, I think every plan talked about uh, late submissions and days you have, like anywhere from 90 to 120, depending on the plan uh, that presented today. And I know in the fee-for-service system, you are, um, under certain circumstances, uh, you have certain codes to build past those timelines when you build Medicaid directly to notify Medicaid why it's late. And there is some confusion around it, and I saw some um, chats in around that. But my understanding, and this is where I'm going to ask our uh, panelists to either confirm or deny this, is that managed care companies do not have that code or a code that you can submit and say, hey, the reason I'm billing you past 120 days is because X, Y, and Z, and here's a code. So those codes that are used in fee-for-service, I don't think are applicable when billing managed care. And so I'm going to open this up, and I want to see how many people will overlap and answer the question at the same time. <laughs> so you're correct. Thank you. Yeah, you're correct, Boris. There's not a code that they would use for timely filing. If there was a reason um, that they weren't able to get their claims timely to us, then absolutely they should reach out to their network manager to see if something can be done as far as an exception. And others, I assume, same thing? Yes, yes. So, um, so when a claim is denied for timely filing, um, you should reach out to the plan, um, and that would be the provider relations uh, department. I think the provider, our provider service folks will just sort of send us your inquiry um, so that we know to reach out to you directly if you have a question. But um, really what we're looking for is information related to why the claims were submitted untimely and sort of like maybe what fever service is doing on the code end. Um, but these claims get reviewed by a team of folks. Um, and so the information really needs to be succinct, well thought out. We need the story about why the claims were submitted um, late. And um, then they're reviewed and um, Sometimes the um, decision is overridden. It just kind of depends on what the situation is, but certainly something we will are very open to having a dialogue about what's going on. So, and same thing for Fidelis. Um, we follow kind of the same procedure. Um, communication, as you mentioned before, is key. So as soon as you realize that there is some extenuating circumstance going on, maybe a system error in your in your system, um, communication to your provider relations rep or behavioral health specialist. Uh, is key into getting the dates and times and figuring out how we can work through this. And again, following through with a team of folks that will review to either approve or deny, um, you know, moving those claims forward. And Boris, this is Sarah. I would echo the same thing. So um, just reaching out. Yeah. And, and I just want to, uh, especially, I mean, I think, you know, you should follow all the advice and suggestions that you're hearing today. But, you know, Casey's point about, if you know ahead of time, especially when there are issues that are systemic, right? They're not always systemic. It might be one-off or maybe because, and we'll get to the whole coordination of benefits and two payers and so, because we have a slew of questions around there as well. But, um, but when they're systemic, and I think as Casey mentioned, is you really should be trying to communicate with the plan ahead of time and notifying them that you notice a glitch in your billing system or EHR, and there might be a, you know, a bunch of claims that are late, or you need an extra month to work through with your vendor in regards to this. I think the more you can communicate ahead, I think the better it is. And like Mary said, you know, you're going to submit a, a reason why they're denied. But if folks know ahead of time that this is coming, I, I, I don't think anybody can guarantee you anything, but at least... Uh, you're, you're starting on the right foot, right? You're notified, you're trying to work through this, you're saying it's a problem. And, you know, in my experience with the plans when I work, I've always had very good results. It's, it's the times when you call somebody and you say, I'm getting a lot of these untimely filings and you're just not paying attention to the claim system and, you know, and still want to get paid, right? So I think it's better to do it up front than to call a year later and say, hey, I now fixed my problem, but by the way, I didn't bill you for a year, right? Um, you know, can you pay me now? So uh, we'll, you know, strongly encourage folks um, um, to do that. There was one particular question, I'm gonna just pivot a little bit to kind of 
uh, what's called, usually called coordination of benefit or multiple payers. And, and I think with Fidelis coming on board this year, I think all of you can do electronic claim with second payer electronic claims, right? Because I think until recently, Fidelis wasn't able to do that. I think you had to submit paper claim, right? But now, Casey, you talked about it in your slides, so yeah. that's the case. And I think others yeah. are able to do that, right? When you have a crossover from second payers, it doesn't have to be paper. Just wanted to confirm that. All right. So just I know we had a question for everybody um, around that. So just wanted to uh, mention that as well. Um, so just uh, getting back to, uh, so we talked about the timely filings. Um, you know, there's a number of questions around telehealth. Um, you know, anything around telehealth or hybrid services, um, you know, and I think we had others that were related to that. So any thoughts around a kind of a general question? I think all of you allow telehealth, right? I think that's not yeah. a problem. Yeah, I think just making sure that you're putting those modifiers in there to let us know that it's telehealth is really important. Okay. Yes, and um, for Fidelis, of course, accepting that place of service 10 for the Medicaid products as of 1-1-22 that went into effect um, for those telehealth and telemedicine services and utilizing those modifiers as appropriate. Thank you. Just uh, heading to other uh, questions. Uh, let's see. Wow, we got quite a few. Okay, <laughs> just trying to work through some of them. And others, please feel free to jump in if you saw anything. I know we also have a number of very specific questions to uh, our panelists. Um, just wanted to check here. Um, Um, Caitlin, do you want to, uh, there was a question on revenue um, codes, and I think an NPI just came in. Do you want to refer back to our billing tool and maybe quickly, uh, if, if it wouldn't be too much, to show folks where some of these codes that they might be looking for? And also the NPI, right? We have that area where it really breaks down field by field. Yeah, so we got, we've seen a number of questions in as we're saying about the MPI, about revenue codes, about modifiers, et cetera. So just want to make sure everyone knows on the billing tool, if you go to the relevant field, so if you're interested in revenue codes, you go to field 42, you click it, you can view the revenue code list. And so this will go program by program. It includes the number of programs, and it will tell you what the suggested or required code is. And so you can easily go through here and see what's relevant. Um, I know we've got a number of questions about core. Core is on the billing tool. The billing tool, every field does have the relevant information for core if there's a nuance or something different. So if you just scroll through, you'll see, here you go, here's core for revenue codes. That's available on the billing tool. We've also got on the billing tool, we have the procedure codes with the telehealth modifiers. So these are still the telehealth modifiers for the state of emergency, but those are still available for you. There's guidance on units. You can view that as well. And then there are the NPI fields. So as you know, there's a number of different NPI fields. We're just gonna highlight for a second 78. So if you click 78, 78 is the required requirement for the referring provider NPI to be provided. Um, so this is a fairly recent change from the state, um, and they are now requiring this. So you can see how that works and what that means for different programs. So if you scroll down a little, there's a few um, qualifications about what that means. As we all know, there's different types that are uh, enrollable practitioners and others that aren't. So depending on who that referring individual is and their practitioner type, this lets you know how to fill out the MPI for the referring provider. And that's for the referring provider, field 78. But we also have, you know, the attending, which is the MPI number, which is required. Um, this hasn't changed. This has been required for quite a while, but you've got all the different information there. What to do if they're unlicensed or not licensed enrollable, et cetera. So you've got all of those details here on the billing tool. 
And if you're interested in billing specifically for 29i, as I mentioned, there's another specific 29i health billing tool. And so you can look on there. And again, it's going to have all of the rate codes. Um, it's going to have all the MPI information you need. Uh, it's going to be linked to state guidance, et cetera, as relevant to 29i. So all of that is available for you. I also just want to emphasize while Doris continues to look through questions really quickly, that on the matrix, we do have specific information for CORE and 429i. So if you go to children, you can see the foster care liaison for every uh, managed care plan if you're on their page and you go to children on the matrix, um, as well as medically fragile and other children specific information. And then under general, if the plan um, has a HARP, then you'll have a HARP contact as well and that will be available to you for the plans as well. So just make sure you're utilizing those resources. And with that, I will turn it back to Boris with some more questions. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so the one question we got, or a couple actually, around when things change, and I think a couple of you talked about where to go, meaning like uh, maybe the address, maybe they closed the program or opening a program or a telephone number has changed. You know, so I guess, one is, I guess, how quickly should those you guys be notified? Are there areas specifically you want to highlight when things change that are more important than others? Um, and want to talk about, because we did uh, have a couple of questions around uh, notification and working with you on making sure that you have the most up-to-date information about providers. Yeah, Boris. So... Oh, Oh, go ahead, Casey. Go ahead. <laughs> um, for Fridello, so you can contact a provider relations specialist or your behavioral health specialist. Um, that would be anything from opening a new site, closing a site, tax ID change, um, as well as those designation and de-designation of services. That is extremely important. Um, as soon as you get that approval letter um, to de-designate or designate for additional services, you could send that on through to your behavioral health specialist, and we can get that on over to our contracting for an amendment to add or remove those services. So anything that you can get to us as soon as you are aware is better. Yeah, and the, the information that we receive uh, related to your organization is used for several things. Number one, it's used for our provider directories. And so that's where the phone number, simple thing, but it's super important so that um, folks that are looking to contact your agency um, have the correct phone number. Um, and then, you know, locations or um, adding programs, um, adding MPIs, uh, whatever it happens to be, if there's a merger, purchasing other organizations, bringing them under your umbrella, those are all really sort of contract specific types of changes. And um, so, for example, let's say it's a clinic and you're adding a location. Well, APG is um, con configured by location. So that's going to affect your fee schedule. So all of those things are really important for us at a contracting level to be able to review. So you're going to uh, need to you know, reach out to provider relations specifically um, to talk about those changes. We do have forms available that you can fill out if you do need to have um, Additional credentialing will certainly let you know, and then you'll go through that process too, or whether your contract needs to be amended or your fee schedule updated, we'll let you know. All right. Um, just want to, you know, there's still a number of questions around authorizations and denials for lack of authorizations or notification. And I just want to, again, underscore uh, the importance to make sure that providers have good you know, revenue cycle management protocols. And, and one, of, one of the pieces of it is making sure authorization and notification is built into the provider workflows. And I think we had a comment where, you know, or a question where provider might be billing before they're able to notify. And I think that's something that the provider should look internally into their workflows and the timeliness. Because if you're billing before you're notifying managed care, you really need to look at that workflow and update it. That means something is not working properly. So, you know, in my experience and what I've done in the past is when individuals call you and you schedule for an appointment, before that person even walks through the door, um, or these days, I guess, gets on Zoom, whatever the right uh, <laughs> venue is, 
you know, you get that authorization, you communicate with the plan. And even if it's a walk-in, you should be trying to get that communication, that authorization before actually the service happens as much as possible at any time. And as all of us know, when you walk into your doctor's office, one of the things they first ask you is like, do you have that insurance card? Right? And it's not that just make a photocopy and they file it. They actually do something with that information um, to make sure, yes, you have that insurance. Yes, you can get these services and so forth. And you should be following the same rules. At the same time, for ongoing processes, you should have ticklers and capability to track authorizations that are expiring, either because timeline has passed or the days, uh, to make sure that you're ahead of that curve. Um, so it's very important as, as a process to make sure you have the right workflows and you have the right tools that be put in place. And again, if anything fails, back to the same thing with the timely billing as I talked about, you should be talking to your plan representatives and saying, you know, we had a bad process, maybe somebody left, maybe there is a gap, and you want to make sure you're, you're communicating. But I think the key here is really your workflows, tools, and notification internally. I don't know if anybody from our panelists would like to add anything, because I know we've got a number of comments and questions around that. Yeah, I think I'll just mention that, um, you know, for folks who haven't really lived on the health plan side before, um, you know, to say that you need to notify the health plan, it just, it, it sort of, sort of understates the importance of it. Um, there's, there's, there's systematic things. The systems need to um, kind of talk to each other. So there's a, the authorization system, there's a claim system, um, and they need to be completely in sync. So the information that comes in on that notification um, is, is it's the same information that's going to come in on your claim, actually. And um, the notification is really for us to build that authorization in the system. It might not go through medical necessity, so you're not going to have a clinician look at it and say whether it's appropriate or not. But in the notification, we're going to be building that off in the system so that claim will pay. So that's why, like Boris said, it's really important for that notification to happen before the claim comes in. Otherwise, we don't know, and um, our systems are set up to look for that notification. So that's sort of how it looks on our end. And um, I know it can be difficult um, to ensure that all of the, the pieces are in place, especially when there's new staffing or um, turnover of staffing, um, just all kinds of issues are on the provider side, which we do understand. And so um, that's why, you know, we want to hear from you. We want to work with you so that we can um, work through those bumps in the roads. You know, most times things go okay, but every once in a while there's some issues. So we want to help you through that. Or I'm just is going to say, for retro authorization, so maybe it's an instance when um, services were rendered and you need to get an authorization for services, please reach out because we can walk through that process. So kind of like Mary's point, always feel free to reach out and we can assist. Casey, I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I was going to piggyback off of what Mary was saying as well. Um, definitely there, there's a fine difference between a notification and a prior authorization in some cases having those systems connect and be able to talk to allow those claims to pass through correctly in the first try. Um, I do also want to add with staff changeover, we know that it's been happening a lot across the country lately. Uh, we are here to provide training. You have, like I said, your behavioral health specialist along with your provider relations specialist assigned to your area. We do um, trainings all the time and we'll be happy to do a webinar or something like this or come into the office and provide that training just to make sure everybody is familiar with the Fidelis process. I'm sure like the other carriers and uh, they're familiarized with the process and can move forward easily in their job function. So, so the, thank you for that. And, and just to clarify also, um, in regards to, you know, and, and sometimes we use this interchangeably, and I think it's important to maybe to, to highlight. So there's an official authorization, right, where you call, you provide, you know, and you request authorization and then submitting maybe, um, you know, in the old days, they used to be called OTRs, right, outpatient treatment requests or, and so forth. Um, but then there's notification, right? And, um, and notification is not always necessarily uh, by providers is seen as the same thing. 
Um, but for some of the plans, it's, it's basically the same thing, right? Because some of the plans need a notification because uh, from what I understand, some plans have to put in an authorization, even in instances where it's technically not required, but not, that notification allows that kind of process. Um, and it's important that when providers notify one, they provide the right information, meaning for what services, you know, and so forth. So it's almost like an authorization process, but there's no like real utilization management review that's going on. It's more, more about administrative process. And I think one of the comments was that not always, I guess, especially in a notification, because it might not be as rigid as authorization, that uh, the, the information might not be coming through correctly into your system, right? So I call you up, I say, I'm gonna see somebody in the clinic and somebody, and I'm just clearly making this up, in a plan puts it and authorizes pro services. So when I go to clinic, I get a denial, right? That could be an instance. So, you know, one, I would say, make sure you notify when you need to. And as I said, communicate. And if you are getting denials and you have notified the plan, I would assume, and I'll look at all of our panelists, that if you provided a notification and there was a mistake because it was supposed to be for clinic, but somehow the plan authorized for pros or some other service, I would hope it'd be relatively easy to reverse that and make sure that the provider gets paid versus if there was no notification at all, right? Yeah, so, so I just wanted to make sure, mm -hmm. yeah. So Ahead, yeah, Mary. I'll just add to that, Boris, yeah. So, so um, you know, we do make mistakes. We're all human. And the person who takes that authorization and who's entering the days in or entering whatever information on the claim on, on the authorization doesn't match what's getting billed on the claim. So we've made an error perhaps in the number of days that were originally authorized. So um, we'll, we will certainly um, assist you with that. Um, we'll uh, file the appeal for the claim on your behalf. We'll fix the authorization. We'll do everything that we need to do in order to um, correct that and to make sure that you're made whole in the end. So um, yeah, so if you really, if you have any questions, just you know, reach out. I'll also mention too real quickly that I did see a question pop up about which um, plans allow for retro authorization. So what I would suggest that you do is to contact the plan um, because every plan may have a different process and we may override and allow the retro in specific cases after review. Um, however, we just don't want providers in the habit of submitting late authorizations because that will really get you know this into sort of a not a good situation i mean the whole point about authorizations is it's a review up front if this is a medical necessity review it's it's a review prior to the service being given um so i would just you know as everybody has said communication is key and um you know we're here to help and and work with you through those times when something happens bump in the road change of staffing or whatever and authorizations aren't coming in so excellent that's that's fine mary because i was going to go to that question next <laughs> about the retro um right and i don't think it's as simple as some plans do retro and others don't i think it's as mary said you should contact and you should have a discussion because you also should not be assuming it's a routine process where, oops, I missed authorization. I'm just going to, you know, I because X plan is doing it, I'm just going to call in there automatically do retro versus Y plan doesn't do it. I think, you know, my advice would be um, assume that all plans will ask you and you're going to have to go for a process before you get a retro uh, authorization. Uh, for some, it might be a little more difficult than others but I don't know any plan that you just call up and automatically always get retro and basically don't have to worry. I think that would be a mistake to make that as an assumption. So I'm always a little concerned about how we answer that question because I don't want it to come across as, all right, this plan does retro, that plan doesn't um, and so forth because it's not as simple as that. Um, so thank you for, for raising that. Anybody else wanted to add to anything? I just wanted to make sure uh, Okay, see what other questions we've been getting here. Um, and again, the panelists, please feel free um, to see if there was anything that uh, caught your eye. And to make sure that, you know, we get to the ones we haven't gone to. 
And, and again, we have a number of questions uh, as we kind of keep repeating, you know, if things go wrong, right? Like there was a question about what happens if an APG rate is not paid correctly, um, you know, or there's delays or anything, make sure that you're reaching out, right? You're paying attention to this. Um, you know, I, I do want to emphasize, I think one of the plans, if not couple, in their presentation talked about remittance and making sure that folks pay attention, not just the denials, um, but all remittances that come in and all notifications back on your claims, because not everything comes back as a denial. Um, and there's other things that happens, and I know providers sometimes miss that because they're so focused on denials, which is good that you're focused, but there's others, um, I guess, reasons why a claim hasn't been processed rather than just denied. And so I strongly recommend that uh, providers pay attention. But again, with questions like, you know, I don't get paid correctly, it was the wrong authorization or notification, the key here is always to continue communicating with the, the plans as, um, you know, this comes up. And, and, you know, one of the things that was mentioned in kind of uh, primary claim submission and resubmission, um, I also want to make sure you guys pay attention to the billing tool that we have. Uh, we do have some guidance in there. I think it's in field four, if I'm not mistaken, on the paper claim, where you have to indicate if it's an initial claim versus a resubmitted claims. And if you are, for whatever reason, resubmitting a claim, uh, please make sure you use the appropriate code, because if you keep saying it's an initial claim, over and over again, you'll keep getting a denial that's going to say this is a duplicate claim. Even if your resubmission is accurate and appropriate, the system says, wait, this is another initial claim, and it will deny you. Uh, and it's pretty automatic in some instances. So I know one of the plans in there, or a couple, I think, maybe had that in their presentation. So I just wanted to um, you know, uh, make sure we uh, address this. I know as time runs out, one of the questions that we, I think, just um, got in general, what happens? If I call the provider, so Boris, you said call. Mary, Casey, Sarah, I, you all said call. We'll help you. What happens if nobody calls me back? Who do I go? How do I, is there an ask, like, you know, I call provider relations. I think some of you said, if you're not getting an answer, call me directly, reach out to me directly. I don't want to put that in because I don't want to inundate you with phone calls and emails as well. We're also giving your, you know, information to over 300 people. Um, so just in, in regards to if people are feeling maybe, like you said, Mary, you know, we're all human, we all make mistakes, people are on vacation, people didn't get to, somehow it fell through the cracks, your phone call, your email, whatever it might be. Um, what would you recommend around billing, especially kind of escalating, maybe that's the wrong term, you know, who do I go? Besides going to the state and complaining to them, but first maybe <laughs> coming to you. Go ahead, Casey. Boris, I can take this one. Um, so for, for Fidelis, we have our uh, provider service line that you can call into. Um, they can connect you with your provider relations representative um, to your area. They, we have several of them throughout the state. Um, and as I mentioned during my presentation, there are four behavioral health provider specialists um, throughout the state. So we have a rep out, Pam, who's out in the western part of the state, and she moves to the western part of central New York. I myself cover southern tier. Eastern part of Central New York, Hudson Valley, Capital District, and in the North Country. And then we have two reps out of uh, the downstate region, Diane and Elliot. Um, so you can contact myself if you're not receiving uh, you know, a call back, and we can filter that out. Usually when the behavioral health specialists are out on vacation or time off, we do have a backup. Um, and with Fidelis, you tend to get two reps for the price of one between uh, the DH rep and your provider relations. So somebody should contact you back within 24, 48 hours. Okay, thank you. Others? Yeah, so same here. You know, um, first have a go out and look at that McTech matrix, see who your network contact is, or you might already know who your network contact is. Um, but if you're not able to, you know, connect with them, my information is here in the slide. Please reach out to me and I'll be sure to connect you or I can assist you with your issue as well. Excellent. Boris, Sarah? this is Sarah. I would echo the same thing. Um, in the slides that you will receive, um, there's contact information for our manager, the other uh, behavioral health provider relations reps, 
Um, you can also contact our customer care. They can help assist as well. Um, so if you do have questions, um, all of the contacts are there. Mary, anything in yours? Yeah, so um, so when I mentioned that I cover the territory for Western New York, like, oh, one single person, what if you're not around? Yeah, so um, <laughs> it, it, it can happen, right? So um, I, I like to refer folks, and I usually do on my voicemail, I always give the customer service number, provider service number. Um, and if you want that, that particular call because you don't want to you know, go through sort of just working with that service person, let them know specifically that you'd like to speak to somebody in provider relations. And they're going to cue that call over to us. Um, it comes to actually a group of folks um, who would be able to address it. Um, uh, also on the McTac website is a really great listing of all kinds of people within our plan. And so um, our leadership is listed there along with uh, folks who are in you know, certain departments, whether it's UM, case management, um, our behavioral health program manager, Allison West. Um, my director, we don't have a manager in between. Um, we all actually are called managers. We manage a process, not people. But Joseph Smith is the director. And um, if you know, I can give out his phone number, we can sure that folks get it if they want. It is available up on the MCTAC website. So um, uh, feel free to contact anybody who's, you know, can, can answer your question in, within whatever your specific question happens to be. Thank you. And, and Kayla, maybe there you go. I think we were thinking the same thing. You can put up the, the context because we've been getting um, a number of questions about folks' contacts. And again, the slides and the recording would be available. So if you don't write this down, don't worry, you'll, you'll have this uh, available. Uh, I do want to underscore because I think every panelist talked about the MCTAC website and billing panel and the matrix and how great it is. We did not pay them to say these things. <laughs> so I just wanted to <laughs> underscore that. Um, but we do work closely with all of our managed care partners in getting that information and making sure as much as possible that it's uh, up to date uh, with, with all of that. So with a minute left, I just want to say thank you to our panelists again for joining us and, and answering the questions. And thank you for everybody who joined. Um, we will be sharing these questions with our panelists. So if you had, I think we have a number of very specific questions to the plans. We'll, they'll, we'll make sure that they get those and hopefully they'll be able to reach out to you or you can reach out to them now that you have their information as well. Uh, from that, I want to say thank you to Caitlin for organizing and putting this together. Um, and we're looking forward to our third annual next year uh, presentation. So again, thank you everybody and have a, a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye -bye. Take care. Thank you. Everyone.